Well, hello, Moto America fans, and welcome back to another episode of Off Track with Carruthers and Vice. I'm Paul Carruthers, the communications manager for Moto America, and Sean Vice is my sidekick. Uh, he's usually in Ohio, but I think he's on the road. But uh, just came back from a from a uh, a difficult weekend in Brainerd. Uh, yes. The racing was good. Obviously, you know we had some horrible horrible things happen. Um, one, one in particular that, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, I know it's part of motorcycle racing, Sean, but it's, it's a tough oh. deal, man. And it's, uh, it, it makes for a very, very difficult weekend for everybody that's involved in our paddock. And it's just it, incredibly sad. And, and I don't even know what to say about it. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just, it just happens every once in a while. And anyway, I, I, I don't even know what to say about it. You might, you might have more to say, but it's, uh, yeah, I feel I feel for the family and the friends, and you know it's always hardest on the, on those left behind. Yeah, it's tough. You know, I know that we all realize the risks and understand it's part of the sport. I get that, and and we we all understand that. But you know, you kind of put it out of your mind um, when you're at a race weekend, and we've we've had some injuries over the years, um, but we haven't had a fatality since that first year at uh, since Laguna Seca there, and. That was uh, what a what a situation to have for your first year with Moto America, Paul. I wasn't with Moto America then; you were, and I distinctly remember being in the media center then when you were dealing with that. And of course, it was some of that again. And um, it's it's just a tough situation. You see, you know, we had some crashes at that track, and um, you know, a lot of them were people were okay. There were some that were some injuries, and unfortunately, Scott Briotti lost his life and. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned in my story this week, I, I had, I did have a chance to meet him and it was really mostly because of where he's from and, and his background. And I'm glad I did because I got to kind of share in what a lot of people say about him. But, um, one of the things I really, and you, I'm sure you notice this, Paul, in our press conferences, every press conference we had, there was at least one rider in that group, if not all of them that said something about, you know, remembering Scott and even some of them that may not have known him, but certainly riders that did know him and, and the guests that we're going to have on today knew him intimately. And we will probably talk about that a little bit, but um, it's, it's, it's a tough situation, but, you know, at the same time, I mean, it's interesting that his service, you know, his son wants to have everybody bring their numbers and slap them on the side of the casket, you know, and uh, it's, it just shows that the spirit of racing, you know, what it means to everybody in the paddock. And um, it's certain, it's certainly not easy to deal with, but uh, you know, we, we go on, it, it felt weird the next day. I mean, we, we kind of, we were sort of towards the end of the day when it happened. So the next day was, you know, another day and we kind of picked up from where we were and, and that's what, that's what you do in this sport, but it's, we certainly thought about it the whole time um, and are still thinking about it. So, uh, you know, thoughts go out to that family and for sure. And, and everybody that knows him and knew him. So um, including our guest. Yeah, it's uh, it's a tough one. You know, I, obviously I've been in a motorcycle racing paddock since I was born. Yep. And it never gets any easier. It's never, it's never any different. It's just, you know, it's horribly sad, but you know, we're, we're the pad motorcycle racing paddocks are always a resilient bunch of people. Yep. And, uh, we bounce back quickly because I think we know that's what the, the person who has passed would want. And it's what they would also do if they're in the same situation. So I think if you look at it that way, then, uh, then motorcycle racing is probably the, the, the best cure for, for what ails you when it, when it comes to something like this, but Anyway, we'll move on and, and speak to our guests with uh, this guy is it, it's funny how I, I forget how young he is and I forget how much success he's actually had. But Rocco Landers, with his two rather dominating victories in Supersport this past weekend at Brainerd, which incidentally were his first and second wins in the class, he's now won 40 Moto America races. He won two uh the two in super sport he's won nine in twins cup and he won an amazing 29 in junior cup he's a two-time junior cup champion he's the 2020 twins cup champion he switched to super sport in 2021 found out that things weren't very easy for him as they had been before not that they were easy but but success came easier to him in those classes and here he is now a winner in that as well so 
you know, we, we knew that those wins would come sooner or later. I think, I think he was surprised as we were that maybe didn't come in his first year or didn't come a little quicker in his second year. But, you know, he's, he's, he's 17 years old for God's sakes. It's like, you know, it's, it, you sometimes expect too much of somebody who's already given a lot and he's going to give a, a hell of a lot more, but let's bring, uh, let's bring Rocco Landers into the conversation. Rocco, um, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Yes, sir. Thank you guys for having me. So when you sit there and you listen to somebody rattle off all the crap that you've done, you've <laughs> got to be a, you've got to be a proud little kid over there in Missouri. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, I, I've, I have a very solid base. So when I came to Junior Cup, it was a bit different because I came from Europe and I, I, uh, I've been racing longer than most adults have, even in Moto America. So it also came down to experience. But yeah, when I was, when I was in the uh, obviously more stacked class with, uh, in Super Sport last year, uh, I think I got like four or five podiums and I had a lot of fun. And I improved a lot, but and sometimes we were scratching our heads because either I was having issues or I couldn't get the bike to work or I was, or we would have a small issue with the team. And it was just like this again, this again. And this year, um, obviously it's been a bit different. I think I have like, I don't know how many podiums I have this year. I think it's like seven or eight already. And we're halfway done. And I was able to win two races, which is awesome. But I mean, yeah. Now, you know, I think, sorry, Sean, I, I, I know this had to have bothered you and you, you better tell me the truth. When, <laughs> when Sam Lockoff won a couple of races last year and then Tyler Scott wins a race this year, that, that had to have been a little bit difficult for you and also very motivating. Well, I think Sam, I think Sam won, well, he, yeah, he won the one race two at Jersey and then Ty won it one race one at road American this year. But, uh, I mean, there's other circumstances that you can take in, but it was it was annoying because, I mean, with Sam, he and I had so many battles in Junior Cup, and he and I he and I get along really well. But we would have, we had so many battles in Junior Cup, and I'm like, this guy's leading me in the championship. He's beating me in all these races. He got more podiums than I do, and now he's just won a race, and I'm scratching my head as to what I'm doing wrong, and. uh and uh, yeah, it was just, we've had a lot, a lot of small, a lot of like super small issues that combined into just a, a, just a giant struggle bus last year with, uh, just a lot of things. You know, Rocco, um, Paul, Paul talked about this and I, I want to kind of uh, talk about it a little bit more. So you've had 40 wins in our Moto America, uh, series and you are third among active uh, Moto America riders and the all-time AMA list. And only two riders above you are Jake Gagne with 44 wins and Josh Heron with 43. And this is in all classes. But if you look at it, those guys raced in both, you know, in AMA and Moto America. So you have the most wins of any rider in, in the Moto America era with 40. The other part of it too is all-time um, active or inactive riders you are actually uh, 12th on the list. You're wow. tied. You're tied with a guy named Scott Russell, who I'm sure you've heard of. I think you've even I never heard of him. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I met him once when I was like six at Laguna. <laughs> he um, so I mean, that, that's a heady group to be in. But, you know, did, when you think about what you've done so far and you're only 17 years old and you've won three championships, uh, already, do you think about that and what you've won and kind of grasp that, or are you are you looking forward to your next win so much that you don't really dwell on those wins, or do you do you sit back and go, wow, that's you know that's been quite a career so far? I mean, the wins are great, but if you don't, if you sit and be complacent, it's it's uh you're never gonna win again. So I mean, you win. I I I enjoyed uh Sunday and I enjoyed Monday but I'm back on track training and working uh within a day or two of the race weekends well the other thing I want to mention is okay Ridge at the yes. Ridge you got you got the pole yeah and you were pretty excited I came and saw you I went in the trailer and saw you yeah. um, and then boy ever since then you're just 
you're just, you got it going on now. Um, yeah. and I know there's some things in your program, but that was amidst a time where there was some, you know, I had done a story in, about this whole situation with the 600. And, you know, I know Josh Hayes was giving you a hard time about the fact that, you know, he's, you know, he won a race earlier in the season, but you guys have figured out some stuff. And I think I know some answers to that, but I, I don't want to say, um, what, what have you figured out uh, in recent rounds and races? Yeah, a, a lot of things. I mean, I uh, it's funny because Ridge, I had been second in a one race. I'd had a bunch of podiums. I had been second in practice and second in qualifying. Qualified second on the grid. Been second qualifying one. Had provisional second spot. I've been second a lot. And that was actually my first time ever leading a session in super sport. And it happened to be pole positioned by, I think, half a tenth. And there were several times where I was really close like i think at brainerd last year i was within a tenth of sean and at like at uh atlanta i ended up getting held up and qualifying and and uh lost pole position by another tenth so it was like really 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 like it was like finally we just led a session like that was the first time i've done that it was pole which was even even cooler and i think i turned into a second and then i got the whole shot and ran off and raced two and ended up like fourth but yeah, we fixed a lot of things. I mean, I, I don't really want to like get into like yeah, the, I understand the politics that. of it. Sure. I don't necessarily agree with the rules, but right. there are tracks that are decent for the R6, namely Brainerd, Laguna's not bad in certain spots, VIR, where you can use the the handling and and uh basically Use the fact that the R6 generally can, you can use a lot more roll speed and kind of lay, lay your cojones out there and send it. But, uh, I mean, the majority of the tracks are just not that way. But VIR, I mean, or uh, Ridge, Ridge was a, it was a, it's a track where you can use the strength of the R6, especially in the first and second sectors. And I, uh, I was able to uh, get pulled there and that was pretty awesome. Yeah, I, I've heard from a little birdie that like there's some other things, you know, it, it, I think you, you, you've had to deal with some things as far as your riding goes as well. Like, yeah, this little birdie told me that like, which, it, which it seems rather opposite than, than most motorcycle road racers is that you, you like, you don't have an issue with the front, pushing the front no. or what have you, you have more of an issue with the rear and that's, I don't know if it, I don't if that's accurate. I don't know if that's a byproduct of growing up on little mini road racers rather than dirt track bikes or how that works. But maybe you can maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't usually like even with, I don't know if it's the way my bike's set up or just the way I ride or the amount of training I've done. But I don't really have issues with the front end. My my issues are mainly the rear end. We made a lot of changes just to give the bike more grip and make it easier on tires. So that is, that has been like, we, we had this, a huge breakthrough at Laguna where basically Josh was, he, I mean, since, uh, since a, a while, he's been trying to get me to just do a couple small things different. And I was being a stubborn little bleep head. And, uh, I mean, he finally got me to try it. We ended up leading race two. And got third, I think, with after battling for second. And uh, that was basically a huge breakthrough, and it helped us so much at Brainerd. Like, if you watch my first laps and uh, pay, the consistency I was able to run, I, I credit that very, very, very much to Josh Hayes, who's helped me so much. And I mean, he's done even more than that, but like, I was able to combine the train, the coaching I've gotten from him, and the coaching I've got from the California Super my school to basically make it to where I was just like the bike bike and the way I felt around Brainerd was almost a dream it was amazing all right well now thanks to those two wins you've sort of established yourself as the biggest challenge to Josh Heron now he's 76 points ahead but you're 28 points ahead of Tyler Scott 76 points is doable but maybe not against somebody yeah. with the experience of Josh Heron I don't think he's going to make too many mistakes I know. I mean, if you think about it, like I think he's had. I think his worst finish this year is fourth. Yeah. And uh, he. Uh, I mean, obviously, he's has a ton of experience, and he's working really well with the Ducati team, and 
everything's been working really good for him. Obviously, it's mathematically possible when it takes it would take some gnarly stuff happening to uh, to put me in the championship hunt. But I'm focused forward. I'm not looking back right now. Now, looking forward, is there are there tracks that you think coming up will suit you, or I mean, does the schedule work in your favor at this point? Uh, there's like there's spots on Pittsburgh and there's spots on Jersey and there's spots on Barber that I think favor all different bikes. So they're 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 better tracks than say Road America is or Atlanta is for the bike. But I feel uh I I, I feel really confident going in that I can at least keep them honest. Yeah, you know, it was funny. It was a weird weekend for for Josh at Brainerd because, I mean, this practice sessions in the qualifying, I mean, you know, he had a tough time, but there he was, you know, in the race and on the podium both times. Did you expect that? Did you think, okay, no, he's struggling. I don't even know if I'm going to see him on the track. And there he was when the racing started. Did you say it was that like, of course, he's going to be there. It almost doesn't matter where he qualifies. Yeah, there, there's a few guys who... uh who no matter how they do in practice, they'll always be there in qualifying. Josh Heron. I don't, I, like, I don't care. I don't look at his, I don't look at his, uh, he's a blank slate for me until the race. Like him, uh, Sam Lockoff were very much like that. Caleb DeCarroll was, when I was racing him in Twins Cup, it was, he'd be 12th in qualifying. And then he, yes. I, I couldn't even hang on with him in the race. And then and Ty, Tyler does that as well. Where like, they're all they're Like for me, a lot of guys are blank slates. They're all racers. They're not qualifiers. Well, that's the thing about Josh. Josh has always said that he doesn't like to test. He doesn't really like to qualify. He almost doesn't like to practice, but it's all about with him going, uh, you know, racing is, is what he, and he gets that going and, and he just gets up there and, and makes it happen. But, um, but, you know, for you to get two wins against, against that was, and, and also against your mentor, Josh Hayes was, was pretty, pretty incredible stuff. I want to talk a little bit about Josh Hayes because it's funny. He, I, I've said this before about him. I know him very well. I mean, I worked with him in the past and he's re- obviously an amazing racer, but he's actually somebody that can articulate what he's not necessarily what he's doing, but what other riders are doing. And that's yeah. a pretty rare gift to have. Some riders can't explain what they do or even tell somebody else how to do it. But I know <laughs> is he pre- how and he works with a lot of aspects of you, not just yeah. your race craft and things, but other things with you. Um, what what is it about Josh? I mean, yeah, I mean, I I I met Josh. I think I met him at uh, it was funny. I met him at Sonoma at Moto America in 2011 for AMA in 2011 when he won like the Superbike race there. It was yeah, wow. Kind of funny. I was a guy who I watched on TV from when I was born, basically. Right. And I met, I, I actually, like, I personally met him in 2019 at uh, Atlanta. And I re- went and rode down at his house. We never really worked together until uh, it was just after Daytona. Like, I was like, like, Daytona was a train wreck for me. Uh, we ended up looking back, and my bike, we found out, was bent three quarters of an inch to the left at Daytona. So wow. I didn't have the the greatest setup there, and we 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 were chasing our tail there. But afterward, we talked to Josh. We actually did a day at Auto Club, just a, a one off day, and it was funny because I I rode his, I, I was like I don't know what's wrong with my bike. It just feels weird, and I rode his bike for a couple sessions, and I was like this thing's amazing. And he rode my bike that I raced at his home. He's like there's something wrong with that. So we ended up finding that gremlin, which really was no one's fault. It was, uh, it was, I, I threw a bike down the road last year and we didn't, uh, my dad rebuilt it and we net, we, uh, it wasn't a huge crash. So we didn't really assume that you would have to, we would have to even check it, but somehow the thing had completely tweaked itself and we, uh, we were able to sort that out. And I went back out on my, uh, on my spare bike. And I was able to finally go as fast as how Josh or do do what Josh was basically telling me I I do or what what I could do. And I was, it was incredible. And and we went out to Chuck Walla a couple weekends later. I think I won. I it was like a career weekend almost. I won all my races, had a ton of fun. And then we were just like, all right, let's go to Atlanta. Let's do some let's do some pro racing and see how it goes. And hmm. I think I was third in the championship coming out of Atlanta. I think 
and we were just like ra- going from round to round. No, uh, no promises about making to the next one. And things were things just kept going better and better and better. And Josh is he he's perfect for me because he doesn't take my crap. He's almost become like a a race like a second racetrack dad to like help help me with all aspects of how things are going at the track. And I mean, I, 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 he's, he's, he's like my right, one of my heroes because he's been there since he raced against my dad when my dad was racing in the nineties. So he's like this insane wealth of knowledge experience. And you said it, he's one of the, one of the few that can turn uh, his experiences to, of, of racing and how things are to, into coaching where he, yeah. Cause there's a lot of guys that can't like, they'll be great racers, but they don't know two bits about coaching. Cause they can't pick things out. They just don't know how they're, how they're doing it. That's and right. there's some guys who are not good racers or aren't even racers at all, but are great coaches because they, uh, they can spot things. But like Josh is like a rare specimen where he just, he's, one of the one of the best coaches, like him and uh, like he's probably the best race coach I've, I've ever spoken to. Not probably, I think he is. And I was able to combine uh, his experience and his knowledge with all of the help that I received from the from in technique from the California Street Bike School, which who I've I've been working with Keith Code since I was four years old, mm-hmm. and he's one of the most important guys in my racing. And I was able to combine all of the genius technique that the extreme bike school teaches with the racing, ment- ment- racing and the mentality and the uh, just the way the way I ride the six hundred uh, that Josh has helped me with, and it's basically just been getting better and better and better. And I've been getting closer and closer and closer to the lead, and then finally was able to win the race as a Brainerd. Yeah, you know when. It- one of the things I want to mention, Paul, I just want to mention this real quick is the fact that when I said that, that uh, Rocco is, is third among uh, active Moto America rides and all times wins. Well, if you actually, I had taken uh, Josh Hayes out of this list because he wasn't a regular rider, but I guess we yeah. should probably put him back in and, and with his, yeah, 80, probably should. yeah, with his 84 wins that are only two away from Miguel and that's just, something. <laughs> Just, and, and just real quick, I want to talk about that. Obviously, he's chasing that a little bit. That's one of his primary motives for doing what he's doing. But I found another motive that he has. And I know you know about this, Rocco. He talks. I cannot believe the dude is in a race, racing for a win. And at the same time, he's watching what you're doing. And he's kind of figuring out, hey, I'm close up to seeing Rocco. I can give him some pointers. because I know. It's, it's what, unbelievable. What is that? Yeah. I, I, it's unbelievable. I mean, he's... He's, it, it's crazy. Like I, I remember after VIR, after he won race one, he comes up to me after the race and he's like, "All right, meet me in your rig in an hour," and just <laughs> sits with me and picks up, picks out everything I need to work on for race two. And he and I, he, I mean, we battled for two laps and he pulled straight away from me. But he, I mean, at Brainerd, like, it's 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 insane. Like I, I, I have so much debt that I have to that guy. Yeah. Is it harder when he's in a race with you? I mean, I think it, I don't know, it'd be kind of, I think it'd it'd be a little more difficult sometimes to think, oh my God, my coach is behind me watching exactly what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. But is that what, do you feel like it's a little more difficult when he's in, when he's in the race that you're in? No, no, I love, I love racing with Josh. He's probably my favorite guy to race with. He's, uh, he's aggressive and smooth and he's never going to, he's so clean. It's, it's, He's he's probably my he is my favorite guy in the world to race with, him and Kevin Olmedo. God, oh, that's cool. That's, that's very, very cool. cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. But I think you'll notice if you look at what he did to that other kid that he coaches in Super Sport. Um, <laughs> he, he, oh, he, he, he would do that. He would do that straight to me. Well, I know, but I think that's that's part would, of the beauty of the whole relationship. Him, and Corey would do that to me, and I would do that to Corey. Right. <laughs> and that that's not going to change the fact that I'm, we're going to go. I'm going to go to. <laughs> Josh is and train with him and Corey for a week and we're just gonna have a ton of fun right now speaking of the training you came in as this skinny 15 14 year old and I was four foot 11 like 92 pounds right incredible wow. so <laughs> then, 
then you had a great growth spurt and you realize, you know, I'm kind of a fat kid and I need to do something about it. And I'm yeah. sure that came with a little prodding from Josh Hayes as well as to what to go out and do. But it seems yep. like whatever it is, you've started to do it because for the first time in your life, I mean, I think you're taking training seriously and you'd never had to do that before. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's been a process because I went from having like a, a kid's metabolism where you eat whatever you want. You don't really gain weight. And like I said, I mean, I'm 5'11 now. I've grown a foot since I started racing Moto America, and I've gained, oh, a lot of weight. But, but I mean, it's 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 been a process because once I once I stopped growing and I quit being able to eat whatever I want, I, I didn't really accept that, and things kept going uh, the bad in a bad direction. But uh, things have just been going better and better and better. And jo- like like you said, it took it took me finally accepting that I really need to get my mind on the right track, but things have been going incredibly well. And I've found some things that work for me that a lot of people might, might call gnarly, but I, uh, I, it really works for me. It's the only way I've found that really works. And, uh, think, I mean, I've been feeling physically better and I've, I, I have, I'd say I have some of the best fitness and physical fitness in the super sport class. Now it's just a matter of getting the rest of the weight off so I can be at my peak physical performance well i'll never forget uh, it was one year at barbara i think maybe your first junior cup championship or your second okay. junior cup championship but i think i saw you set a guinness book of world records for eating the most guinness or the most I, reese's peanut butter oh, I, I, I knew you were oh, going dude. there paul <laughs> oh dude i i probably did some fan some fancy reese's are dude reese oh my god sponsor me reese's please it's the best thing in the world Except, except for winning super sport races, that's the best. But then, then second, and second they probably best don't go hand in hand. I know that's the problem. That's why. That's why. Like you gotta, you gotta take the best thing. The best is winning super sport races. But uh, yeah, no, some fan, like she. It was funny because after I won at New Jersey, I think uh, I can't remember who's. I think it was Hannah. But she goes, she goes. Oh, what are you gonna do to celebrate your championship? And I was like, I'm gonna eat some Reese's. Yeah. And uh, I think, um, I don't remember, I, I can't remember her name, but she, every year since then, she's come with this bulk bag of Reese's. Uh. And I'm like, you're killing me, but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny, though. I, I, I've, I've found ways to enjoy Reese's while not going crazy and That's to enjoy cool. other things as well, but specifically Reese's. You just got to eat them while running. Exactly. <laughs> No, I think I actually do that. So, Rocco, let me ask you this question. This is tricky. So, your uh, we we'll we'll leave your two sisters out of this. Um, your so your mom, your dad, you. Who yeah. wants it? Who wants it the most of money? Me. Okay, you you do. Okay. Yeah. And your dad, I mean, I see the drive and passion that your mom and dad have for it, and I know your dad. My gosh, they do anything for you, Rocco. I know that. I mean, the stuff that I know your dad does as crew chief and what he's trying to do. Um, it's it's more it's 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 not for him. It's for you, obviously. Yeah. No. I mean, if 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 I didn't want to race, my dad wouldn't be at the track. Right. I mean, right. if I didn't, he like he, whenever I was like one or younger, like six months old he would turn AMA Superbike or Mo- Supercross on. And the only thing that would get me to sit still was if that was on TV, even when I was like four, four or five, six months old. And yeah. uh, I mean, it's just, some, I've, I've always, I've always liked it. It's always been one of my favorite things. Like it's always my favorite thing. I, I love it. I, I, if I wasn't able to race professionally, I, I'd still be at the track. I'd still be doing track days. I want to ask you something physiologically with you um that i recall in the past and it's when you were on the start line sometimes and we would notice this situation and i don't know specifically you would probably know if you've been diagnosed with this but you have some kind of performance asthma or asthma yes okay and you used to use an inhaler i don't I do. see you doing <laughs> that anymore um do you still do it uh it, we've gotten it more under control last year was unbelievably terrible like I would come off the bike and just have to go straight to the rig and not be able to breathe. But mm-hmm. a lot of things have changed. Like I, I have a, I have a new regimen that I'm on to keep it to where I don't have to just hit it 10 times, a 10 times every hour. Mm-hmm. 
but like I I have technically like technically if you classified I have severe asthma. Okay. Where if I don't have the inhaler, I'm kind of screwed. But uh, but like it's gotten so much better from from how it was, especially last year. But I don't I don't I don't usually I don't I don't need to use it much anymore. Do do people do people grow out of that? Um, Some people do. Okay. And is it just straight up asthma with you or is it performance yes. asthma? You, okay. It is. So it's not. Just a, a de- yeah. There's different types of asthma. Like there's asthma. Uh, some people grow out of it. Yeah. Like, like generally if you have it past 15, you're going to have it forever. But, uh, but for like, I know other races who have it. I know athletes who have it. It's really, it's, it's sort of like diabetes where it's just something you can easily, pretty easily work around as long as you have the stuff. But, uh, but see, there's different types. Like there's asthma that's brought on by physical exercise. There's asthma that's brought on by cold weather, hot weather, allergies, dust, a lot of things. And I happen to have every single one of them. So <laughs> no. it's not a huge deal though. It, it's, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm happy. that it's one of those things that's much easier to work around than I mean, it, it, yeah, like, like I would rather, I would much rather have this than have a lot of other things. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I've got to ask you something about your goals now. Yes. Back when we first got to know you junior cup days, et cetera. I mean, you qualified for rookies cup. It kind of turned into a bit of a mess with COVID and, and trying to get over there and travel and this and that. I also think when you rode the bike you quickly figured out by then that these bikes might be a bit small for you yeah now, have your goals changed i know at that point in time you wanted to be you know moto gp world champion you wanted to race moto two you wanted to do this you want to do that have your goals have you changed those goals at all i mean have you thought about like okay my correct path should be to become moto america superbike champion and then go to the world superbike championship what is where do you sit with that now yeah, things think think I mean right now, I'll tell you what, I'm focused on winning super short races. That's all I'm focused on right now. But uh I'm focused on Pittsburgh. But yeah, I mean when I tried out for rookies cup, like I said, when I started Moto America, I was four foot eleven, uh 90 pounds. When I tried out for rookies cup at the end of that year, I think I was five four and like 120 pounds. Mm-hmm. And when I went to Rookies Cup, I was five nine and one hundred and forty pounds. Wow! So it, things have a lot of things changed, and it got to the point like I was I was a full I think four or five inches taller than the second tallest Rookies Cup guy, or three or four inches, and I was like four or five kilos heavier. Like like I was racing against guys like Alonzo and Pedro Acosta who are. You know, David Alonso, I think whenever I, like I've raced with David Alonso since I was like 12 years old, uh, because I raced with him in Moto4 in Europe. But, uh, but I mean, I was racing against him when I was like 5'9", 135, 140 pounds. I'm going against uh, a guy who's 4'8", 4'9", and 86 pounds. And that was why that was part of the thing. But the rookies cup, it, it was like you said, you said it, you said it the best. It was just a train wreck from the from COVID. Like I couldn't even get over for some of the rounds because the policies were so strict. So I mean, yeah. So do you, Rocco? Do you think you've stopped growing? Yes, probably okay. not. Yeah, if I get tall, I'll be like one inch. Okay, so you might you might end up six foot, but. Right now, 5'11", 6 foot, you know, I know you only want to think about super sport in, in Pittsburgh, but I want to project a little bit. You are probably a perfect size for a leader bike. So oh, yeah. stop with that super bike. It's going to come pretty soon. Do you think it would be something next year or year after? I mean, where, where are you projecting to be there? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> I've found a setup that I can, I really like on the R6 right now, but really, honestly, my my only goal right now is to win more super sport races this year because that's the only way I'm going to be able to be able to race next year. You know, there's a guy that works with you and I've talked to him a fair amount just because I've known him for a long time. And it's Tom Halverson. I mean, the guy has yes. been involved in road racing forever and ever. And I talked to him about you and he, that guy, I'm sure you know this, but that guy thinks the world of you and uh, awesome. 
yeah, and he thinks you have huge potential and huge talent. And, you know, he's good with seeing talent. He's seen a lot of riders over the years and, and, and understood that talent. So I know that you have a connection with Yamaha. And, you know, aside from, you know, the 600s versus the next generation or whatever, you have, you do have, a, a, you've developed a loyalty to Yamaha. And I mean, it seems like they tend to have situations and I'm not saying they're, they're unusual in this regard, but there's a, there's a bit of a ladder there that you could, you know, stay with that pro program. I mean, we saw, well, Josh Heron for the longest time, but certainly Garrett Gerlach, but I mean, Cameron Bobier, they all kind of moved up through JD beach. I mean, he's still riding a Yamaha and AFT. So mm -hmm. you're kind of in that you were you're not kind of, you were in that family now. So I would think that there's some things down the road that would kind of keep you within that group. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, that, that would be, that's ideal for me. Uh, I love, love working with them. Tom and I, we all, we get along personally really well. Like, uh, we, uh, I'll always go, go talk to him every day at the racetrack. He, uh, it was funny at Laguna. He comes up to me. He's like, I wish you knew you could win one of these things as much as I do. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, dude, dude, I got to win one of these things. Come on. This is at Laguna after race two. That's and, cool. uh, yeah, he, he, he is, he's so cool. He's like, not, a, I'm not, uh, yeah. I mean, he, there's not much else to say. He's like, well, just one of those just awesome dudes that you meet once in a million. Where you, yeah, you, you, he and I just clicked the moment we met. Yeah. He's a good guy like that for yeah, sure. What uh, you, I want to talk about your persona in the paddock. Let me see how to put this. You're probably the friendliest guy in the paddock, and I'd like to try to be that way, and I, I aspire to do that, but I don't get around the paddock as much as you do, and it seems like basically every rider you have a relationship with. Is that just, you have a, just that much love for the sport? Um, do you like to cheer other people on? Is that just part of what your personality is? Yeah, I'm just a homeschool weirdo. No, but <laughs> uh, my... Uh... Yeah, it's funny. My dad always gets mad because I'm just I'm I'm uh, annexing the the team Zuma, and he always he's always like, "We need the Zuma," and I'm just riding around seeing people. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I just I like talking to people. It's fun. What 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 else am I gonna do? Just sit in the trailer? Well, you you just touched on something that's interesting, and I've seen this. You know, my wife's a teacher, so I see this a lot. And we, you know, even when my son was younger, he went to regular school. But um, when you're homeschooled, you there's this there isn't really a social aspect. And yeah. a lot of homeschooled kids, you know, their parents try to get them involved in activities and doing things. And is that is that part of it a little bit that you you know because you're home and you're doing your you know you're not sitting in a classroom that you know when you go to the track you kind of get to be out with a bunch of people and that's part of it. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I like I love homeschool because number one, you get a billion times better education than you would get in public school. Yeah. Uh, you're school doing less school. I mean, I graduated early, which is sick. I uh, I, I mean, I have uh. I get to race motorcycles, which is pretty awesome, I guess. Yeah. But uh, I mean, there, there, uh, there's way more bonuses to me personally doing homeschool. I have friends who are homeschooled, and like they said, they can't do it anymore. But I, uh, I mean, I've been homeschooled since I was eight years old, or seven years old actually. I think I was seven or eight. But uh, but I mean, it was kind of a necessity because I started going to Italy to race pocket bikes when I was eight. Right. And I can't exactly just be, and that was before all the Zoom and. Uh, like uh, online school. So it was homeschool pretty much or, or bust. And it ended up working out pretty good. Like you get a much better education that you get in regular school because it's actually prioritizing your education. But, uh, but I mean, it, it's amazing. I really, 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 really like homeschool. It's probably what I'm going to do with five kids one day. That's cool. Um, I have to tell you something I was, a little, I was surprised about, and I, we're going to, we're going to talk about Scott a little bit here. Um, yeah. Rock, I want to do that. So when we went to the memorial service or the memorial uh, in the morning, when you did the lap, when I, when I first got there, I actually didn't know. I mean, I figured you knew Scott, but I didn't know your relationship with him. I knew based on the guys that have raced at Loudon or whatever. And I mentioned this in, in a recent story I did about Ben Glady and those guys 
And, you know, I talked to Christina Day, Ben's mom, about it, about the fact that you got to know him through kind of when Ben was on yeah. uh, the team, right? Yep. Um, okay. And you did that lap. And I'm like, okay, it's it's badass enough for you to win two races like you did. I don't know how you did that lap, how you held it together. I mean, it was such an emotional thing. Do you even remember doing that? Or yeah. was it, do you have an out of body? Okay. How did you do that? How did you manage to just hold it together to do that? Yeah, I mean, like you said, Scott, he's 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 like, like if other people are one in a million, he's one in a, I don't know, octillion. He is, <laughs> he was the he was one of the best dudes I ever met in my entire life. Yeah, and I actually met his son first, Reese. He Reese owns uh, RB Graphics, and he does right. all my, he does all of my decal decals on my on my bike, and I think I met him in at the end of 2020. And I got to know his dad through him. And I remember the first time I met Scott, he let me, it was, it was the coolest thing. He, he let me go out on his uh, brand new Jixxer 600 that he just bought. Wow. The race. And I got to take that out for a couple sessions and, or a session and had a lot of fun, but we started talking and working together over the off season of 2020. And I mean, he was one of those guys who would literally give you not only the shirt off his back, but probably his hat and his shoes too. He was amazing. Mm. Like you can't, you can't, you can't overstate how cool of a dude he was. And I mean, and there, I, my dad and I were talking after, after it happened. And uh, my dad said, we were, we were kind of like, we we're kind of like saying, Oh, well, what if they're still going to do the race? And my dad was like, I was, he was like, you still, you, you want to, you still want to do this. Right. And I was like, dude, Scott would kick my butt if I left the racetrack right now. Right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I was spoken, spoke to his team a little bit and his daughter, Darian, and yep. she, uh, she gave, she, she said she wanted, uh, us to do a memorial lap. So we did like the moment of silence or whatever. And I had the extreme honor of taking his bike for a final lap around Brainerd which was uh pretty 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 cool. I uh I felt like I felt like he he gave definitely gave me a bit of a a bit of a push out there on track and helped me win those races. Yeah, I mean, I talked to Brandon Posh about that in the press conference, you know, obviously his girlfriend is is Darian. Yeah, now. Darian, yeah. Yeah. And I asked him like cuz he had a breakthrough this at Brainerd as well and was on the podium. And, and he said the same thing. It's like, you know, it's weird how, when something like that happens, that that spirit drives you forward and yeah. lo and behold, you won, you know, two races at Brainerd after this tragedy that happened and, and you doing that lap on his bike. It, it, is that part of what it was? I mean, you were just driven to, to do that. I don't even know, dude. It was, it was, uh, I, I felt good in the first session, but I ended up getting pulled the next morning by almost a second. And it was funny because on my lap timer, the number that I got pulled by was 0. 0.734 and Scott's racing number was 0. 0.34. I ended up winning race one, I think, by or race two by 13.4 seconds. So it was kind of like and, and Brandon kept or Brandon kept having like we kept noticing like weird things on lap timer. It was like has three, four in it, which is kind of a funny little coincidence, but. I definitely feel like I'm, I'm not a super religious person, but I definitely feel like there was something, something there. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of something there, um, I'm going to get a little po. I don't know what I'm going to get. I'm going to get a little, uh, Just get it. Yeah. I think, you know, this, you know, about the blue Jay, right? Yep. I do. Okay. So for people, for the fans that may not, well, not have been there, didn't know, there was a blue jay that hung around that paddock and it was in tech. It was it was perched on Jen Bauer's laptop. It was in various people's paddock areas. People were feeding it. It was literally on people's hands. It was all around the paddock. And did you, I mean, did that occur to you, Rocco, that like what is going on? I mean, well, is, I definitely saw that blue jay in a lot of spots. And yeah. it spent the most time over. I saw it a lot over at Innovative. So that was that was some, definitely something. And uh, I don't know. Don't got much else to say on that. <laughs> that was that was definitely something. And it, it was it was I mean, it was a tough weekend, but 
I mean, uh, yeah, there's, it, it was, it was gnarly. I mean, in race one, Darian actually, she, she, uh, she came into our, um, hot pit and was just chilling there before the race. And it was funny, like she posted, but she posted something and it ended up happening in the race. And I was just like, and she was, she was willing to join me up on the podium and collect our team trophy, which was huge honor for me and for our team. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, Okay. So you got a couple weeks off before we go to Pittsburgh. Um, You said Pittsburgh's a good track for you. Um, Yeah. I love that place. Are you glad to have a couple of weeks or are you, would you rather go? No, I want to go to the racetrack. <laughs> That's what I thought. I thought no. that. <laughs> oh, I, when I'm at the house, I'm at the house I, all I have to do is run and fast. Through this. <laughs> well, gosh, Paul and I, I mean, I'll tell you, those race weekends take a lot out of Paul and I, we need a, we need a Not little me. bit of time to adjust, you know? <laughs> Not me. No, I have fun. I've been fasting yeah. since like Tuesday morning. Actually, last time I ate was Monday night. That's insane. I'm very, very hungry right now. I bet you are. On the racetrack, I'm not hungry. <laughs> well, good. So you need to you need to occupy your time doing other things. Yeah, um, right. Well, listen, we're we're thrilled for you. I mean, we knew last year when you were working through things, it was just a matter of time. And you know, super sport is a steep curve, and you know, but now you're on your way with that whole thing. You've got some things figured out, and you know, your little your little team that could is just doing some incredible things with that, that 600. So, you know, we wish you well the rest of the season. I mean, we've got three rounds left to go in six, six races. And like Paul said, you know, may not catch uh, Heron, but uh, you can notch some more wins and get closer and, and uh, see how it goes, you know, by the end of the year. So um, yes, sir. We, we wish you well on that. And Thank I want to, I want to say, Hey, so Rocco, since you're, you get around and talk to everybody, I'm going to give a little bit of spiel about the, the corner workers. And I want to get your opinion when you're out there on the track. And after you win, I, you give the thumbs up to the corner workers, right? They mean a lot. to Yeah. You, oh, dude. Yeah. I, I like the corner workers. I mean, they're out there not getting paid. It's volunteer. Right. They're out there because they love racing motorcycles. That's right. They love, they love motorcycles and they're, they're, they're out there just to, that's the least you can do. Yeah. And exactly. then it's awesome when they'll come by, they, they come by my pit after the, after the race weekend. And I had a bunch of guys come over just a group. They're like, Oh, thank you. And I was like, thank you guys. <laughs> I wouldn't be out here without you guys. And and that's the cool thing about it. I mean, with, with those, if you're a fan of racing, road racing and a fan of Moto America, that I, I say it all the time. That's the best seat in the house. You're out yeah. on the track. You get to, you sometimes get, sometimes get hands on the motorcycles, but you certainly get some camaraderie with the riders. And yeah. if you come around and talk to them, the riders, you know, love you, love these corner workers. So we, every week talk about the importance of having corner workers. And, you know, I just wanted to bring that up again. And we're, we're still working on the details about the zoom uh, thing we're going to do. Rocco, I don't know if you know about this, but we're going to have a zoom based uh, kind of a call to action. Um, basically anybody and everybody that has any interest in corner working from people that have never done it before. And we're going to send out this invitation to go attend this zoom interview and, and, and not zoom interview, zoom uh, presentation. And yeah. they'll be all on it and they can ask questions. They can talk to our chief marshal, um, David Hall, who I know, you know, and you know, everybody is going to get a chance to be part of this. And then once they do that, that's kind of the first step for being working as a corner marshal or corner worker in our series, in Wira, anywhere else they want to do it. So, and all the riders embrace that. And I know, I know you do too. So. Well, I mean, you need to have competent corner workers. Like I've been to uh, club races and even, even uh, nationals where the corner workers, like they're uh, they don't know exactly what they're doing. Right. But, but uh, I mean, it's great that they're going to be able to give, be given a little bit of uh, instructions and and uh, I mean, we already have the best corner workers, but we'll get even better ones. Yeah, I mean, it'll just help help all the way down the line. So, so that's something we're gonna do. But um, Paul, um, you know, we talk about Rocco a lot. I mean, it's funny how we saw him. I mean, we kind of he kind of grew up with us a little bit, didn't he? Yeah, definitely. He was a baby, and now he's not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. But um, thanks so much for being on with us, Rocco. That was a good podcast. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Enjoy. thanks, Rocco. It was nice to have you and uh, look forward to, as always, to seeing you again in Pittsburgh. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. All right, boy. Appreciate boys. you. Thank you. See you, Pittsburgh. Bye.